Hello, my entrepreneurs, friends, and welcome to this session today where we have a very, very exciting interview partner. You know that um, on this channel I did a few interviews with entrepreneurs. Today we are going to have a chat on innovation and entrepreneurship, and I'm very proud and I feel honored to have one of the leading capacities worldwide in information management, innovation management, excuse me, with me, Professor John Besson from the University of Exeter. Hello, John. Hello, Armin. Nice to speak with you. Nice to speak to you. Uh, how are you? Very good. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon here in the UK. Uh, you could almost forget that we're in some strange times, but uh, we're doing okay. That's fine. You know, I, um, I, I can only confirm that the weather in the UK is much, much better than its reputation. <laughs> John, um, um, first question to you. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about you, your, your background, your track record and, 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 and what, you are, what you are doing today? Sure. Um, uh, I guess the short version, um, once upon a time I was an engineer. I'm really dangerous these days in an oil refinery, but I began my career as a chemical engineer. And mm -hmm. I worked for big companies because that's very much the industry, uh, multinationals, people like Bayer, and um, a company called Sibagaygi, which is now Novartis. So big companies. And I became frustrated, I think, with the innovation challenge. Um, we were successful, but the sense I had as a young engineer was we could do much better. Um, we, uh, we had plenty of resources. Money wasn't really a problem. They had bright people like me. So clearly brains <laughs> wasn't a problem. Um, anyway, I had the opportunity uh, to study for my doctorate whilst working in a company. It was again part of Novartis, um, looking at how one of their plants in Scotland managed innovation. So I worked as an engineer, but a bit like an anthropologist living with a tribe, I was studying the innovation process. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful, fascinating. I, uh, I learned so much, uh, not least that it's not as easy as it looks, um, but it gave me a taste. And so I really stayed in that world since, doing research, um, doing consulting, teaching in particular, which is something I enjoy doing, but trying to mobilize the knowledge about this challenge of how we manage innovation. Um, and that's what brought me really here today, which is a, a long time since those early engineering days. Interesting. Um, and um, from, in your opinion, John, what role does innovation play in entrepreneurship and which types of innovation tend to create the biggest success stories? <laughs> okay, big question or questions. Um, I guess if I should begin with uh, my definition of innovation, um, uh, for me, it's very simply creating value from ideas. Um, a lot of the time that's commercial value, but my current work is very much in the uh, humanitarian sector. So I work with people like the Red Cross or Save the Children. Mm -hmm. They're not concerned with making money. They're concerned with making the world a safer, better place. Mm -hmm. So it's social value, but it's the same process. And I think that's one of the important things. So that's innovation. Um, the relationship with entrepreneurship, for me, it's fairly simple, um, beautifully put by one of the great writers in this field, Peter Drucker, who mm -hmm. has a, a book I would still highly recommend called Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And what Drucker said was that innovation is what entrepreneurs do. So it's essentially their, their stock in trade. I think we've become a bit confused in recent years. We forget that you can do this in many different contexts. We've tended to think entrepreneurs equals startup. And that's fine because that's clearly where entrepreneurship is very important. But you're also an entrepreneur if you're a change agent inside a large company or if you're part of one of these humanitarian organizations trying to introduce a new way of delivering aid or a new food product or something like that. So innovation is what entrepreneurs do. And for me, they do it in many different contexts. And I think that might be important because we tended for a long time to have this kind of separation. Um, certainly the bodies of knowledge which are useful come from different places. The 
field I began with, innovation management, came out of the, the, the technology management issues that uh, organizations like MIT would look at and big companies would worry about. Um, a lot of the entrepreneurship literature began looking at very small businesses and startups. Over time, of course, these two have converged and we're now in a world where, as I said earlier, um, Innovation is what entrepreneurs do, and they do it in different contexts. So that's my model. Um, and I think entrepreneurs aren't simply lucky, and they certainly aren't just doing it and getting there. There's a process, and the smart entrepreneur understands it's a journey, the stages in the journey, how to mobilize and manage within that journey. Yeah. One of my questions actually was, do startups necessarily need to be innovative? I don't know if that uh, if you have already <laughs> answered that question, but you know, I was just thinking. You know, there is this kind of urge, you know, to come up with something completely new. I'm a startup. I somehow must, uh, I don't know, revolutionize the world. Do you think that is really is that always needed? No, uh, and, and again, for me, and I guess I've, over the years I've refined and simplified my definitions, but. Mm. One of the things I think is really important that we understand, whatever kind of innovation we're interested in, social or commercial, novelty is distributed along a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, we can do what we do a little better. It's what mm -hmm. we call incremental innovation. It sounds boring, but actually most innovation, most of the time is incremental improvement, doing what we do better. Other end of the spectrum, you do have occasionally the radical stuff that the world's never seen before. So you have a spectrum, all sorts of positions along that spectrum of novelty. Now, yes, some of the highly publicized entrepreneurs might be at the radical end of that spectrum, but they don't have to be. And sometimes they're taking established ideas and putting them in a different context. Um, one of my heroes, uh, if you ask me about uh, uh, my particular examples of entrepreneurs, is a, a guy who was called um, Dr. Um, uh, Venkata Swami, an Indian man, you can tell from the name. Yeah. Um, and he retired uh, from his day job as an eye surgeon. So he didn't even start being an entrepreneur until he'd finished one career. Mm -hmm. And on his 65th birthday, he said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to deal with a challenge, an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to innovate. What he wanted to do was look at cataract care because that's something he'd worked on as an eye surgeon all his life. Mm -hmm. So he didn't invent a radical new operation. The operation he understood well, that was fine. Mm -hmm. His challenge was how do I take this expensive operation, costs about $300 in India, maybe $3,000 over here in Europe. Mm -hmm. How do I take that to people in rural India where the average wage might be less than $2 a day? And they can't afford it. So what he was trying to do was essentially innovate around cost reduction without compromising safety. Mm -hmm. Now, that's yes, radical in terms of what he was trying to do. He wanted a tenfold reduction of the cost, but not radical in terms of pushing the technology frontier or something the world had never seen before. Mm -hmm. So for me, that kind of story, which was wonderfully successful, and now 12 million people or so around the world can see who would otherwise be blind, but that's the consequence of entrepreneurship applied with incremental innovation. That's very interesting. And why do you think, because that's a, that's a huge entrepreneurial success. And, and as you say, it, does nothing, it really has nothing to do with, I don't know, coming up with something completely new, but the innovation concentrates on one aspect of the overall package, I would say. So, so, so what is... What was the critical success factor? Factor. Why could this be a success then? Yeah. I think what he did was, first of all, have the, uh, the passion and the commitment, the vision, which we know is important in entrepreneurship. He, okay. This was important. Um, but then also the, um, the open-mindedness to search un unexpected places. He knew by definition that what he was looking for wasn't going to be found in the health sector. He'd spend all his life working in there. He wouldn't find any answer there. So where else? And it's a wonderful story because he found his answer under McDonald's golden arches. 
uh, whatever you think of McDonald's as a food company and so mm -hmm. on, what they've done very successfully for low cost, using yes. largely unskilled labor uh, with a pretty standardized product anywhere around the world, um, they've delivered the, the kind of package that Dr. Venkateswamy was after. So he took the model from McDonald's, how do they do it, and transferred it. Now, for me, what's interesting is they didn't invent it in McDonald's. They borrowed all their ideas from Henry Ford. So it's, it's what we sometimes call recombinant innovation. Uh, but that's fine. You know, there's no problem in borrowing someone else's idea and shaping it to your world. So in a sense, the, the radical thing was taking a well-proven idea or set of techniques and putting them in a different context. And in doing so, he um, set up a new way of thinking. So perhaps what was radical was before that, um, there really hadn't been anything available for people in those difficult conditions to get eye care. After him, not only was the model applied to eye care through his organization, but many others, other medical entrepreneurs said, well, if you can do it with eyes, what about a hip replacement yeah. or a knee replacement? And in fact, there's a wonderful entrepreneur again, but in the same mold, a man called Devi Shetty, who is a heart surgeon. His speciality mm -hmm. was pediatric bypass surgery. So taking oh. hearts out and so on. And Same principles. Henry Ford, they call him the Henry Ford of heart surgery in India. Yeah. Um, what he's done again is enormously impressive um, in terms of cost reduction without compromising safety. In fact, safety record in his hospitals is better than almost any other hospitals in the world. So it can be done. Uh, and he's changing the paradigm. So the impact is radical. Um, you could say it's a kind of business model transplantation. It wasn't mm -hmm. creating it from zero, but yeah, it was transplanting sure. a model from one world into a very different world. Yes. But and change agents, entrepreneurs need to be able to do that. Yes. And why, you know, reinvent the wheel, as they say, you know, why, you know, yeah. trying to come up with something. It's like lending the idea from somewhere else and reapplying it to your own, to your specific challenge. And, you know, if you're thinking of, of big entrepreneurial successes, such as Apple, for example, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows that the mouse, for example, was not invented within the Apple company, for example, right? And there are so yeah. many of those. And uh, as you said before, I, I, I fully agree. Uh, McDonald's uh, is really an admirable organization in terms of operational excellence, you know? Yeah. Not in terms of um, customer intimacy or, 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 or the quality of their products or whatever, even though you might even argue in terms of quality, you know, because it is a very, is always the same level of quality, which is yeah. amazing. Um, so talking about successes is, is, is always very motivating. How about failures? Have you seen uh, major failures in, uh, in, in, in corporates or in entrepreneurial uh, contexts? And what role did innovation play uh, uh, here, or um, maybe I should say, what role did lack of innovation play without, you know, yeah. going too far? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think part of the challenge is we don't hear so much about failures. That's it. We learn a lot more from them. Um, I think there are many examples of failures. Um, what I like about entrepreneurship as a field of study is that we are getting a lot of messages which say failure is okay. That actually, um, by definition, when you're trying to make something different, when you're trying to innovate, um, you, you, we say in English, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. You have to experiment. That carries with it the opportunities for failure. Um, I think rather than highlight particular failures, for me, there's something about the context in which failure can happen um, and whether that's seen as... Um, uh, something which has to be stopped at all costs or whether it's something that can be um, not encouraged. We don't want people to fail for its own sake, but if we can create a climate in which intelligent failure can happen, that's quite supportive of entrepreneurship. If, if I think of the, uh, the kind of context, the famous context which 3M created, um, this is one which has allowed huge amounts of entrepreneurs working inside the company. 
intrapreneurs, internal entrepreneurs, um, from the guy who invented masking tape early on, right through to the famous post-it notes team of Art Fry, Spencer Silver. But essentially what's going on there is the, the permission to play the 15% policy in 3M, but basically mess around. And that will mean making mistakes and so that's okay. As long as you have the bigger picture in mind that you're trying to create value, that's good. If I contrast that with uh, the humanitarian sector, for me, one of the challenges is it's a very difficult world to work in, but the challenge there is there's a, almost a risk aversion because this is dealing with vulnerable people in crisis in disaster situations um, and often using donated money, the organization tends to play it very, very safe. So entrepreneurs, that's not a very supportive environment. Um, there's a, a case study which uh, I find fascinating and both encouraging and sad. The encouraging side is it's about radical innovation, just like the eye surgeon. Um, for a long time when we delivered food aid, the model was simple. We had lots of food surpluses in the West, so we take those, we put them on airplanes, take them to places in Africa and distribute them. Later on, when we ran out of food surpluses, we thought, well, we'll take the money and buy food in the local market and then distribute it. So there's a lot of innovation within that world, lots of logistics and so on, but no space for radical change. And the particular story which I find so, so challenging, uh, in about 1985, uh, a field worker for one of the agencies couldn't get physical food to people. Every time he put it on the back of mules, the bandits came and stole it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in desperation with a starving group of people he needed to field, he approached his boss and he said, look, I know this is crazy, but could we give the people some money? Because maybe just with some money, they can find their own way to the food and medicine they need. Mm -hmm. And his boss was, for me, one of those great innovation um, leaders, innovation bosses, because he said, officially, I didn't hear you say that. I don't want to know. Um, unofficially, give it a try. Yeah. And so this was very much below the radar. It worked. It worked well. That guy then told some of his friends in a bar somewhere and they tried it. So you have lots of little pilots and it works. Of course it works now. Um, but it took 35 years for that idea to move from um, uh, the situation there to where we are today, where now the World Food Programme, the big United Nations agency, distributes most of the aid in the form of cash via credit cards or mobile phone credits. Now, there you've got a, a, an institutional challenge. It's not the entrepreneurs as risk takers so much as the attitude the organization has to risk. It shouldn't take 35 years for a good idea in that space to diffuse. And that, for me, is, is, is a kind of failure of the organization to work with entrepreneurs. Understand. Last question, John. When it comes down to innovation, what are the three tips that you would give young entrepreneurs to make their business a success? <laughs> great a great question um well i think the first one is is believe in yourself and believe in what you're trying to do um my eye surgeon is for me one of my heroes because he believed um many many others in the field of social innovation but also in commercial innovation believe there's a passion and don't let go of that um at the same time and so the two are kind of connected my second tip is don't assume you know it all and in particular, um, build your networks. The big thing, I think the big lesson we've learned about entrepreneurship is it's a multiplayer game. And that the smart entrepreneur very early on starts to tell his or her story to other people and gets them to share the vision, to add their perspectives, to tune it here and there. It's a, it's a cooperative endeavor. And I think it's no, um, uh, no surprise that some of the great entrepreneurial businesses, you mentioned Apple, for example, were actually partnerships. You have more than one person. It's not just yeah. a single vision. You have Jobs and Wozniak, yeah. Lennon and McCartney, um, Hewlett and Packard, you know, plenty of them. Procter and Gamble, they're 200 years old, but they're same sort of thing. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's my second thing. It's a multiplayer game. Build your networks. 
And the third, and I'm a teacher, so I'm bound to say this, um, we do know a lot about innovation and how that process plays out in whatever context. So any entrepreneur can draw on that. We've actually got about a hundred years of written research. So back in about 1917, articles began to appear about how do we manage this innovation thing? And people have looked at it from all sorts of angles in different countries and contexts. So there's masses there. Mm -hmm. And people like me write textbooks and give courses to try and distill it. You don't have to use our books, but do tap into that knowledge base because there is a process, there is a, um, uh, a set of very useful recipes which can help you be a more effective entrepreneur. Great. Thank you very much, John. If I may uh, give a, f a little summary of, 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 of what we learned from you today, and you correct me if, if it is wrong or if you would like to add something that I'm forgetting. The first thing that we learned was innovation from your point of view is turning ideas into value. And that must, that needn't be a monetary value because also in charity, um, a value can be created and it doesn't, like the Red Cross, it doesn't really have anything to do with making more money. So it's more about helping people. Then um, the, the next thing that I, I keep in mind is that um, entrepreneurship happens everywhere. So it's not only the Lone Ranger, you know, who, who's starting to... Um, change the world, but also uh, in big companies, there are entrepreneurs, change agents who yeah. are developing innovative ideas and implementing them. And by the way, innovation is not just the big, not only the big disruptive thing, it's also little changes to existing processes, products, uh, business models, and so on. Um, then I uh, would like to remember your, your critical success factors, um, a passion, vision, to be open-minded, and also to reapply what might, might have been a success in a different context to your own, to your own challenge. Uh, the failure thing was quite interesting for me because you kind of circumvented this by saying, well, there is no real failure. I, that, that's actually how I, I understand it. You know, a failure is learning. So uh, even if, if there is a big failure, it's still uh, part of the innovation process. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, um, uh, developing uh, your, your, your path and, uh, to the solution. And the th uh, last but not least, the three things or the three tips that you would like a young entrepreneurs uh, to take away from this conversation is first of all, belief. Secondly, build your networks, work together with others, uh, uh, combine strengths, and uh, use the knowledge that is out there on the internet, in the books, and so on. Does that kind of summarize it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And uh, my, 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 your, your, your interpretation of the failure thing, it's all about learning. And isn't it? You don't have to learn. I guess that's the only caveat. You can fail and just say, oh, well, I failed. Why did I fail? What went wrong? Can I then apply new lessons to make sure I do it differently next time? That's, that's the capability we want to build. Yes, and coming back to this knowledge part, maybe for our entrepreneur friends who are watching this, um, you are the author, co-author of a fantastic book that I read myself and that it was played a major part in my MBA uh, thesis 10 years ago, uh, which is called Innovation Management. And uh, it's wonderful. And I think it's the ninth edition right now or the seventh? Seven. We just put the seventh edition to bed. Yes. Managing so, Innovation, that's the title. Managing Innovation, excuse me. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a, it's, it's a multimedia book. It combines various sources of information, not just the reading. It's about uh, it's sources on the internet, videos, podcasts, and so on. And I would highly recommend this to everybody who wants to improve his or her innovation skills. Now... Let me summarize by saying thank you very much, John, for this very, very inspiring session. This was Armin L. Rao from A. Leonard Rao, the Entrepreneur's Entrepreneur. And please leave a comment underneath this video. Uh, I'm answering uh, every comment that you might have. If you liked it, share it with the community. See you soon. And don't forget, lead yourself.